Hello and welcome to the Driven Wheel podcast. Today we're going to be talking about another one of my own personal cars, which is a Jaguar XJ8. Mine is an X350 and it was made in 2002 and it's the 4.2 V8 non-supercharged version. Um, Jaguar made these cars between 2002 and up to 2009 and then they superseded it with something called the X351 which was a bit of a step forwards for Jaguar because it, well it doesn't look like a Jaguar to be honest with you, it looks modern and futuristic um, and my car, the X350, is still in the sort of deeply conservative branding that Jaguar were doing at the time. So they're all four-door saloons, uh, there's a long wheelbase option for chauffeuring if that's what you want to do, all a rear-wheel drive and power is fed to the rear wheels through a ZF6 automatic gearbox. Uh, so they started the engine range with a V6 petrol and then there's a 3.5 litre V8, then they did the 4.2 V8, and finally they did a supercharged V8, which pushes out somewhere in the region of 400 horsepower. In 2005, Jag introduced the V6 diesel variant, which obviously has improved fuel economy over the petrols, and it was a popular option at the time because, well, there were certain tax advantages and many governments wanted us to buy diesel at the time. So one of the things that makes the car interesting is that the X350 uses an all aluminium body and this helped to reduce weight over its predecessor and importantly it made it lighter than its direct competition. Now I'm aware that Audi at the time were also making their A8 with an aluminium body but actually the Jag was more advanced in the way that they put it together so that's quite interesting. The car was designed for motorway cruising and for fast day road driving really. It's capable of taking four adults in leather seated luxury to the south of France or just cruising boulevards in LA. So firstly before we talk about cars we need to talk about what bonded aluminium is. Now bonded aluminium is something which was developed in the early 1900s and it was actually developed in the aircraft industry because it allowed people to create very stiff aircraft bodies or fuselages and it also allowed them to stiffen the wings of these planes. What it is, is you use a very thin skin of aluminium and then you bond that onto the substructure, the chassis or the fuselage and that gives incredible stiffness. What Jaguar did in this case is they went one step further and they developed a system called riv bonding that uses both adhesive and self-piercing rivets to hold it together. Now let's take the example of something like the roof structure of a Jaguar X350. You've got your body shell already put together and you want to put the roof on. Now the way this process works is you have the roof panel separately and you apply adhesive all the way around the edge of it. You then press the roof panel onto the car and you heat cure the adhesive. I'm not talking about you put the car in an oven to cure it like you do with paint. I'm talking about localised heat curing here. You just cure the parts which have adhesive applied to them. Once the adhesive's cured, you put self-piercing rivets through which help clamp it together even better. Now, this is an incredibly strong and stiff technique. Jaguar reckoned that it was over 50% stiffer than its forebear, and crucially, it was over 40% lighter. Now, the issues which regard repair of bonded structure cars are well known and are now well understood, but we briefly need to talk about another manufacturer here. Lotus actually pioneered the bonded chassis all the way back in the 1960s with their Series 1 Europa. This had a steel chassis, which was bonded into the fiberglass, and it was exceptional for stiffness, but unfortunately it was near impossible to repair cost-effectively after an accident. What they did to solve the problem was they used a bolt-in chassis in the second series car, and this got rid of it. Jaguar did something different. They put a crash structure on the front, which bolts on and off, and what it does is it means that there's no structural damage to the car as long as your accident doesn't exceed 10 miles an hour, 
what that did was it helped with repairability and it helped to keep insurance costs down. Now, it is possible to repair these bodies to a very high standard, but not necessarily using the factory build techniques because they're very difficult to replicate in a small body shop. It's also worth saying that the aluminium is prone to corrosion, especially on the earlier cars. Now, I know often we don't think of aluminium as something which corrodes. We think of steel as something which corrodes. But unfortunately, it does. And if you're buying one now, you need to pay attention to it because aluminium is a little bit trickier to paint than steel and corrosion repair is not cheap. Now, the areas which mostly corrode are the door bottoms, the front and rear windscreen frames, and around the boot. Like any corrosion, the sooner it's treated, the better. But don't let that put you off, though. There are plenty of these cars which have spent their lives in garages, and they just haven't corroded. So, suspension and drivetrain. The suspension is McPherson strut at the front, just like most family passenger cars are, and it's double wishbone at the rear. All cars have air suspension on all four corners and are capable of lowering themselves over 100 miles an hour for stability. Not entirely sure how important this is for day-to-day -day driving, but I love the fact that it can do it. Okay, let's talk about the ride quality. Now Jaguar have always been known for good riding cars, and this really is no exception. It's worth saying, however, and the purists will tell you this regardless, the X308, the predecessor to this car, was on steel springs, and it undoubtedly did ride better, but don't think this is a bad riding car. It really isn't. The reality is the damping is of good quality, and the car does ride well. It's composed over small bumps, and it's still composed over large bumps. The 4.2 litre V8 is a quad overhead cam engine, and it's driven by chains, not belts. The earlier series of the V8 engines, the 4 litres, well the 3.2 to the 4 litre engines, had a plastic tensioner design which used to break down due to heat. Now, the later tensioner designs in this car get rid of that problem. This one makes about 300 horsepower and it delivers that to the rear wheels. It does lack in torque compared to a modern turbocharged car, but it is very, very smooth. Jaguar decided not to fit any of these with proper LSDs. Instead, it relies on stability control to keep you on the road. This cost-saving exercise does impact driving in slippery conditions, or when cornering quickly. I think for most owners it won't be an issue, but it's worth being aware of. The ZF6 automatic box was game-changing when it was introduced. Its ability to lock up every gear using clutches and its self-learning capabilities make it impressive today. It does suit the character of the car, and it's smooth, and it's reliable if serviced. Jaguar said it was sealed for life, as did BMW, as did every manufacturer who was fitting these at the time, but ZF themselves say change the oil every 70,000 miles. And having rebuilt one of these, I really can't recommend you do that enough. They're very complicated inside, there are very small oil passageways, there's a lot of little pistons which have to move around, there's diaphragms, there's clutches which wear, there's all sorts of bits and pieces which generate, essentially, friction material, and you don't want that floating around in your gearbox, so I can't recommend enough that you get them serviced. What's it like to drive? So when you sit down in an XJ, it's obviously a luxurious environment. The wheel comes electrically to greet you and the seat slides forwards. The seats are leather and they're adjustable every which way, and they help you get comfortable. Interestingly, Jaguar spent money on an electrically adjustable pedal box. I don't know of many cars which have this. And what it does is it allows you to obviously shift the pedals, this is both the brake pedal and the throttle pedal, forwards and backwards at the touch of a button. I've often found that because I'm quite short and I like to have the wheel quite close to me, I sometimes struggle to get comfortable in cars. This is brilliant because I can have the wheel nice and close and yet I can have the pedals a little bit further away and that makes it, well... It means I can get truly comfortable, which is great. Contact points are all really good. My personal car has a half-wood steering wheel, which sounds awful, but actually it's really pleasant to use. 
the infotainment, climate control systems, they're very, very dated now. The touchscreen is not as responsive as a modern counterpart. Having said that, for 2002, it's pretty good and it's still intuitive. What's nice is the stereo is still very good. It might not be as sharp as some premium audio, some of the Bang & Olsen stuff that you can get today, but it's still very, very good. And because of the refinement of the car, it really works. It's got something called a J-Gate gear selector, and this has very few safety interlocks, which is something you can't do with a modern automatic. What this means is you don't have to push a button to put it in drive or reverse. You knock the lever straight back. And this little point makes driving the car infinitely more relaxing. It's quite a funny thing. So you don't have to push a button to pull off, and that really suits the ethos of the car. The J-Gate selector allows you to limit what gears you can be in. So if you put it in three, that means the car can use gears one to three. It's good in terms of it does give you some manual control over the gearbox, but honestly, you can't pick and hold a gear, and it will still shuffle occasionally going around a corner where you really don't want it to. It's passable but there are much better systems, and just the update of this gearbox, which gave you sequential manual control, was a much, much better product. It's worth saying a bit more about the ZF6. The way it's mapped is interesting, and it's different to cruder traditional autos. At, say, 50, if you want more power to overtake, when you go and squeeze the throttle, it'll drop a gear. It might pick fourth, it might pick third, depending on how much throttle you're using. But even if you put on full throttle, it won't drop all the way down into second, where peak power is. If you do want peak power, you have to push it through down to the kickdown switch. This obviously gives maximum performance, but it also gives a jerk. It gives a lurch as it changes down to that lower gear. Now, some auto gearboxes are extremely keen to kick down, it's normally auto gearboxes which are paired to quite weedy engines, but it's really nice in this case that it doesn't just bang straight down into the highest power gear. It lets you use the torque of the motor and it pulls the car down the road in a much smoother fashion, very suited to a Jaguar. So when you drive it around town, the throttle mapping's too sharp, there's no doubt about that. On initial take up, it's easy to lurch out of junctions. It really takes practice to drive it smoothly, and the gearbox, when cold, is susceptible to thumping the transition from first to second. On a motorway or on faster roads, the throttle mapping feels entirely normal, and the gearbox is smooth. Motorway and fast A roads really are what this car was built for, and it's where it excels. The level of refinement on offer is impressive, and the performance is adequate, if not fast. I mean, think, you know sort of EK9 Type R fast. It's not a quick car, this. In a straight line, though, the car's really stable, even well into three-figure speeds, and it allows you to concentrate on the road rather than keeping the car in line. So we're going to talk about driving the car quickly now. I appreciate that most people who buy these cars don't drive them quickly, and there's probably a good reason for that. If I'm honest, it's pretty compromised. On a bumpy road, the car starts to fall apart. Despite its lightweight, it's still a heavy car, and it's very easy to run out of suspension travel over bumps or compressions. You can mitigate this to some extent by the way you drive it, but you actually don't need to be going that quickly to experience it. Traction in the drive for the 300 horsepower model is excellent, with only a really determined clog getting it to spin up in first. During cornering, it's okay in the dry, but it does want to spin up the inside wheel without too much effort. In the wet, it's passable, but it really is quite easy to get it to spin up in a straight line. And going around corners, it just wants an LSD, so it puts its power down more effectively and more predictably. The oversteer transition is dealt with very clumsily, thanks to the open differential and soft spring rates. And it's not very nice when it does it. It's perfectly easy to catch if you're comfortable with the car oversteering, it's absolutely fine. 
And if you are so inclined, it will do skids or drifts, whatever you want to call them, but it needs over-aggressive steering and throttle input to hold angles. It doesn't want to do it. It's not happy. The steering itself, though, is hydraulically assisted, and it's got a really light steering effort. This aligns with what Jaguar wanted, and it's a bit slow to self-centre, and turn-in is a bit vague. What this does, though, is it helps it feel as settled as possible at high speeds. When the car's loaded up in the corner as well, the feedback is surprisingly good, certainly better than, say, an Audi of the period or a Mercedes of the period. I, I really do feel the steering is a great compromise between stability, turn-in and feel. I think Jaguar did a really good job with this, and I'd, I'd highlight it as one of the better features of the car. So, the engine, obviously, and this one is a V8, and it always sounds good. It's remarkably muffled in the cabin. All you get is a sort of light syncopated bass as you accelerate. It'd be nice if it made slightly more noise or perhaps had an exhaust valve set up, but that's really nitpicking. You do need to rev the engine to get brisk performance out of it, and when you do, it's smooth and powerful enough for overtaking and for road use. Around 300 horsepower often seems like a nice compromise when you want decent performance but not full-on lunacy. Remarkably, and this really is remarkable now, the engine is capable of returning over 30 miles to the gallon on motorway runs. When I bought the car, I read this and I just thought, what a load of rubbish, because I've owned V8s and I've driven V8s in the past and I know what they're like. Realistically, it'll do low 20s on a run. This car really is capable of doing 30 miles to the gallon. Around town, expect about 23. But it's great that it's actually capable of returning decent economy because it's got a good-sized tank and it means that you've got a sort of 400-odd mile range. You're not stopping too frequently. It's relaxing. So let's have a talk about the ownership prospects. Like any car, you do need to buy one of these with your eyes open as there are lots of tired examples out there. If you do find a decent one, however, you can enjoy luxury motoring for the fraction of the cost of a new equivalent. They are prone to issues with water ingress, and the aluminium bodies do corrode, as I've mentioned, but there are lots of specialists around to help run these cars effectively. And if you buy a decent example, cost really should be minimal. The engines are generally reliable, and the gearbox can get to over 200,000 miles. In terms of looking after these cars at home, it's entirely possible. A decent diagnostic tool such as Autel or Snap-on is a must, but the drivetrain is simple, it's well understood. The air suspension can give issues, but the system has generally proven to be reliable as a whole, and used parts are commonly available from breakers if you're on a budget. Individual electronic modules are worth a mention as well. They can fail, this is often due to water ingress, once diagnosed, they're easy to change out if you're used to working on modern cars. They're really not that complex, these, it's best to say. If you're used to working on the sort of 2000 plus generation of cars where they've got a CAN bus, you'll be fine with this. So I think these cars represent staggering value currently. They're still reliable, they're refined, they're powerful, and they're capable of everyday use. Crucially, they make the driver feel special in a way that big Jaguars always have done. Large engine traditional saloon cars like this are deeply unfashionable at the moment, don't mistake that. And this is fantastic news if you want to experience a V8 on a budget. They are undoubtedly still depreciating. You aren't going to buy one of these and make money, but it's at quite a shallow rate now, so your losses are going to be minimal. These cars represent the end of an era for Jaguar. Traditional looks, handling, interior, and the range of engines do make them dated by modern standards. If you're happy to forgo fashion, and you want a special luxury car on a budget, these are definitely worth a look. Thanks for listening. This has been the Driven Wheel Podcast. <laughs>